All right, last week we ended with chapter 17, which in many ways leads into chapter 18, but you have to stop somewhere in these hour-long classes. So chapter 18, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples across the Kidron Valley. Now, Kidron. Kidron means darkness, darkness in Hebrew. Uh, you probably heard of the tents of Kedar, the, the dark ones. Often the, the, these were the, um, the nomadic uh, people out there in the desert lands. So the Kidron Valley is the valley of darkness. Now, if you know your Psalms, you might be thinking of Psalm 23, though I led through the valley of darkness, right? The shadow of the, uh, well, so it's possible that John's telling you that information. It's the Kidron Valley to remind you of what's coming here. That even though he's going to go through the valley of darkness, so there's going to be, uh, he's going to uh, have a, uh, a resurrection. He's going to come forth. It says, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Again, even the garden imagery you could see of possibly uh, Psalm 23 with the, the good pasture. Now, Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place where Jesus often met, the, met there with his disciples. So Judas, becoming a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests, the Pharisees, went with their lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was before him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? Now, before we get into what, what's going to happen next, there's a lot packed in here. If you go back to the, uh, the uh, rebellion in the time of David, with Absalom. You remember what Absalom did? Absalom chased David out of the city. David, in fact, leaves the city before Absalom gets there with his army. And David flees the city, and it says he crosses the Kidron and goes up to the Mount of Olives. And what happens is then Ahitophel, one of David's advisors, one of David's counselors, one of his men, is a turncoat. He goes to Absalom and says, Absalom, listen, let me tell you, here's what you need to do. You don't need to go take your soldiers and chase David with his mighty men. Look, give me a small band of soldiers. If you, we'll go over there by night in the darkness. We'll take out David. As soon as we get David, we'll bring him back to you. And the, the rest of the people, they will, they will eventually follow you, Absalom. So... Absalom first listens, uh, and then the, his, his plan, Ahitophel's plan, is eventually rejected. And Ahitophel goes out and hangs himself. Now, when you look at Matthew's gospel, you can see for sure. Matthew's hoping you're going to see that connection here. But John also seems to be hoping you're going to see somewhat of a connection here with Judas because he mentions the Kidron. Okay, so then it says, uh, verse 5, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus said to them, I am. So whom do you seek? I am. So I am. If you go back up to chapter 17, verse 26, I made, them, I made known to them thy name, and I will make it known. So the name of God, the name of God. If you go back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, in the Hebrew there, Ahi, Ahi, Ahi. Actually, 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 I am that which I am, is translated into the Greek, egoimi ho'on, I am he who is, I am the one that is. In our iconography, we get the second part of that, ho'on. You often see that, the, the O and the W and the N, it's an omicron, omega, and a, a new, that, that's, that's a reference back to Exodus. In the iconography, when you see an icon with Jesus, you'll see in the halo, You'll see that circle with what looks like a W and an N. That's that second part of the divine name in the Septuagint, if you go back and look at it, in the Greek of Exodus 3, uh, 3.14. I am he who is. But in John's gospel, oh, thank you. Ron, uh, thank you, Bob. Bob Clancy has put there a great example. So look at that on the, on the left side of the icon. In the halo now, you see a circle. That's an omicron. That's the O. And then above the uh, head of Jesus, you see an omega. That's the W-looking thing. And then over to the other side of Jesus' head, you see an N. 
So this is this is the O looking thing. The circle is the Omicron. That's the, and then the W with the N is one word, on. So the one who is. And so this is in the iconography. They're trying to show you there the divinity of Jesus. Whenever you see an icon, you see in a halo, you see a cross. You know you're dealing. That's Jesus in the story. And then the the you're always going to see, ideally, if you can, you're going to see that that Greek there. Okay, so. The, in John's gospel, thank you, Bob. In John's gospel, we have, uh, we hear the other part of the divine name, Egoimi. So Egoimi Ho'on is the Greek translation of the divine name there. The first part of the translation of my name, I am, I am. In fact, in English, you often get that as a translation, I am. So the uh, I am who I am, in the English translations there in, the, in most Bibles. So, ego imi, I am, I am. The phrase simply in Greek means I am. I am this, I am that. So, but in the New Testament, particularly in John's Gospel, when you look at the Greek of the New Testament, you're not looking at just regular run-of-the-mill first century Greek. You're looking at Septuagint Greek. All scholars agree that the New Testament Greek is formed by, influenced by, the Septuagint Greek, which is the translation of the Hebrew and the Aramaic, the Hebrew and the Aramaic texts from the Old Testament into Greek. So when, when a New Testament author is writing in Greek for a Greek-speaking audience, you're going to expect to hear echoes of that Greek text, just like you know, like we might quote from a translation we know well. Modern America, most people will trans they'll quote from the King James Bible because the influence of that text on American culture. Well, the same goes with the, the Septuagint. Where they're going to quote from the, the Old Testament or they'll make allusions to it, it's going to be from that Septuagint, that Greek text of the Old Testament. And so, ego imi, I am, you expect that there's something going on here in John's Gospel. And so, when you look at the, the references, here, when Jesus says, I am, you can see there's something going on. He says, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say before Abraham was, I was, which would be normal to say. Before Abraham was, I was, right? But he says, before Abraham was, I am. me, And they pick up rocks to stone him. So they realize what he's doing. He's making a statement as divinity. He's revealing the divine name. And for the Jews, that would be not only obviously blasphemy, but the very least, the very least, it would be profanation of the divine name, just to say it out loud like that, which they at that time were trying to avoid saying it. So Jesus says the divine name, and then they also realize that he's he's saying something more. He's making a statement as divinity. Why do you stone me? Because you making you a man make yourself equal to God, they say to him. So that they understand what he's doing. So then you can see it's quite clear here now. When he says, this is chapter 18 of John's gospel, verse 5. They answered him. He says, whom do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When he said, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. So the Synoptic Gospels will show the power of Jesus in this latter part of the Gospel. In the, as Jesus is going to the cross, the Synoptic Gospels prepare you for that, as we say in the, sing in the Kentuckian on the Feast of Transfiguration, that he revealed his glory so that his disciples would know that he suffered willingly. John doesn't tell us about the Transfiguration. So John, instead of of talking about the power of Jesus, the transfiguration, handles it another way. He shows Jesus, says the divine name, and everyone in front of him suddenly just hits the ground, showing that Jesus is in complete control of what's about to happen. And so, the uh, again, showing his disciples that what's about to happen, he's suffering willingly. It says, uh, again, he asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I told you, I am. 
So if you seek me, let the men go. So look at three times you get the divine name. I am, I am, I am. Three times the Bible, of course, is important, especially in the Gospel of John. So I am, I am, I am. Verse 9, this was to fulfill the word which he had spoken of those whom thou hast given gave us to me. I lost not one. You can refer, you can think back to um, earlier in the gospel in chapter 17, when he had the previous chapter he talked about that. Of those whom thou hast given me, I, I lost no one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest, slave's ear, and cut it off. He cut off his right ear. Now, if you're in defensing, you know what he just did. This is not, when you swing a sword at somebody, you don't just cut their ear off, okay? You're not, cutting an ear off is the, is the sign of an expert swordsman. Don't forget, Peter was a fisherman, okay? This guy was not, you know, just, a, <laughs> you're run of the mill. This is a very strong man. And he, along with the other fishermen, they could pick up these huge, heavy, wet, nets don't think of modern nylon nets these are these are those nets that they would soak the water very heavy and he has a sword and this is a these fishermen when they're out fishing they keep a knife with them of course a, a small knife and they can cut things and deal with the fish and cut string if they need to peter and the other disciples are used to using knives peter's got a sword though peter and the other disciples have swords they're waiting they're expecting for a revolution here. We've talked about this in other studies. And notice it says he cuts off his ear. What's Simon doing? Well, he's, he's pretty smart here. He knows that there's no, it's unlikely that he, with a few guys, are going to be able to take out this, this band of soldiers. <clears throat> so hand-to-hand -hand combat, unless Jesus inter intervenes, it's not going to go well. So what Peter does, he pull, simply pulls the sword out, which that alone would be, Enough to hope they would stand off and they could, they could run. But cutting the, the servant's ear off is a sign to those that not only is he armed, but he can swing this thing back off. And so, but Jesus tells Simon, Simon, put your sword away. Do you think, do you really think I need help here? So, but this is classic Simon. This is a great example of Simon in the New Testament, in the Gospels. Simon does what he wants to do, and when he thinks of it, Whatever comes to mind, that's what he does, right? We all know people like this. But Jesus is going to use that natural virtue of Simon, that courage, which sometimes is a little off, right? <laughs> but, but remember, he confronts Jesus. Let's not go to Jerusalem. You got the story about Jesus. So Jesus is going to hone that natural virtue of courage that Simon has with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see Simon as this great leader of the apostles in the book of Acts. But that's for another study. We also hear, not only is it Peter that did this, but we hear the guy's name has ear cut off, Malchus. So why do we hear Malchus? Well, we're going to hear also in this chapter that John, the author of this text, is known to the high priest family. So there's, he, John tells us the name of the servant whose ear was cut off because he knows this guy. He knows who he is. He's connected somehow to the high priest family, which we're going to see in a second. Verse 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain, the officer of the Jews, seized Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Luke and John, there's a lot of similarity between Luke and John, uh, are the ones that tell us about Caiaphas and Annas. In Matthew and Mark, you only hear about Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the high priest that year. The Roman, the Roman uh, Empire would appoint the high priest as they will. Well, this was a show of their power and authority. This is why the Essenes believed that the entire Temple system, everything was corrupt. The Essenes didn't offer sacrifice in the temple. They didn't go there to offer their sacrifices. They didn't participate in the Passover of the temple in Jerusalem. Totally, it was totally corrupt in their mind because the, the, the temple did not have the glory cloud. The ark wasn't there. The glory cloud wasn't there. The high priesthood, the whole thing was, was controlled by the Roman Empire. It was all, it was, the whole thing was a sham. So the, um, so the, 
the uh, the the band takes Jesus to Annas first because Annas was the high priest before Caiaphas, and so they believe that Annas was really the high priest, but he had been removed by the Romans and put Caiaphas in his place. So therefore, let's go to Annas first. Then they're going to Caiaphas, who is the official one by the Roman Empire that can hand him over to Pontius Pilate. First of all, honest, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had given counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Back in chapter 11, verse 51. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. As this disciple was known to the high priest, he entered the court of the high priest along with Jesus, while Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the maid who kept the door and brought Peter in. Well, who is this other guy? Well, all commentaries agree. Again, this other disciple, the other disciple, this is John, the evangelist. John, the evangelist, who's going to give us the inside story of what's happening there in the, pre, in the house of the high priest. He is known to the high priest family. He can even go to the door and tell the maid, hey, let that guy in. So he's somehow connected. Uh, Eusebius. Eusebius suggests that the uh, the family that John comes from is connected in some way to the family of, of Caiaphas, intermarriage or something like that. And so there's so John knows the high priest, he knows the high priest family, he's connected, they know who he is, he can walk right in the door. But Peter can't just walk in, he's from Galilee. So they he gets him in the door. Uh, verse 17, the maid who kept the door said to Peter, are you not? one of the man's disciples? And he said, I am not. Now, the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire. Standing, uh, because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. We'll see the charcoal fire later on in the gospel. Uh, the So he says, I am not. Three times we're going to see him deny that he knows Jesus, deny that he's a disciple. This is total apostasy, three times, pretty serious stuff. So why do I point this out? We're going to see a threefold restoration at the end. Why this is important. One of the themes of the Gospel of John we see from the very beginning is the disciples' faith wavers back and forth. They're not perfect. They, it says that disciples believed in Jesus when he worked the miracle at the wedding at Cana. So don't, it says, then the disciples began to believe in him when he worked a sign. Now, we've talked about the Gospel of John, the sign faith, those who believe because of a sign. So the disciples are waffling back and forth. They believe it sometimes because of what Jesus is saying, which is good. But then they start to fade and slip a bit. And then Jesus works a sign that brings it back up. And Jesus works a sign that brings them back up. So this is, we're going to see in the Gospel of John that the disciples are not perfect. They waver in their faith. They, they don't believe Jesus is risen from the dead until they see him in the body. And only then do they believe. This is going to be the point of the gospel, that there are those who believe and have not seen. And, of course, we're looking at each other right now. So the, so the gospel of John is not simply, you know, a camcorder dating myself. I don't think they even have camcorders anymore, but I should say a telephone recording or something. I don't know. It's a, but it's not simply just some sort of a recording of what happened. John is telling you the story about Jesus for catechetical purposes. That doesn't mean he's making the story up or modifying it. He's telling you, he's picking certain details in the life of Jesus that he sees relevant for his audience in the 90s in Ephesus. And that audience is not too different from us today, 2,000 years later. We, like John's disciples in the 90s, have never seen Jesus, and yet we believe. And Jesus says, blessed are they who believe and have not seen. Right? We have believed because of what we talked about last week. Jesus prayed that, that there were, he don't not only pray for his disciples who, have, who will see him risen from the dead. He prays for those who will believe, this is in John 17, for those who will believe, even, uh, even though they have not seen, those who will believe because of the words they hear from the disciples. 
And of course, that is the disciples of John in the 90s, and of course, all the disciples of Jesus for the last 2,000 years who have not seen the risen Lord and yet have the faith of the disciples, because faith comes from hearing, as St. Paul will say, not from seeing, right? It's that, that belief, the faith because if you've heard the words, not faith because you've seen the signs. <clears throat> okay, now, uh, chapter 18, verse 19. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all Jews came together. I have said nothing secretly. Why do you ask me, ask those who have heard me what I said to them? They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing by struck him with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, if I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? So this is what we're going to see in this gospel, in all the gospels, but John's really going to emphasize this, that there is nothing, no charge they can lay, lay upon Jesus. He has done nothing wrong. There is nothing they can do. The Jews try to accuse him of having broken a law, as we're going to see in Deuteronomy 17, but they themselves have broken that law. Jesus has not broken that law. They believe Jesus is lying, that is, by presenting himself as the, as the king, and therefore he's broken Deuteronomy 17. But Jesus is not lying. He is the king. And so the only ones who have broken the law of Moses are the Jews, as we're going to see in chapter 19. And then they hand him over to Pontius Pilate, the representative of the Roman authorities, the Gentiles of the region, and Pontius Pilate three times declares him innocent, but still has him scourged and turned over to be, to be crucified. So the Jews and the Gentiles have nothing they can say against Jesus. And so this is a little, a little, a little flash of light of what's going to be coming later here, a little hint that here they are punishing him. They've struck him though he said nothing wrong. Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Verse 25. Now, Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They said to him, are not you also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a kinsman of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the cock crowed. In the other Gospels, you'll hear like Matthew, it says, even your speech betrays you. I mean, we can tell you're a Galilean. You're, you're one of those Galilean disciples. In, uh, today, it's very difficult to do in our modern society in a developed you know, country where you've got uh, telephones that can go across villages and across cities and across nations. You've got radio waves. You have TV. And so what's happened is all the di different little subtle dialectical differences that used to be present in most societies are no longer here in America. We don't notice this. But any of you who are from another country, you know that in many countries still, you can hear subtle differences of speech, vocabulary, and accent from one village to another. Okay, you can go down to Central and South America. You can see this. Uh, Avelina, she's uh, from the Philippines. She can probably attest this as well. From one little village to another. In the same language, you, of, of Tagalog or Ilocano, from one village to another, slight differences. Although these things are starting to disappear now because of radio waves and telephones. Right? You can pick up the phone and talk to someone in the other village. Right? So now the, they're hearing the, the language is kind of irony now. In, when I was in Jerusalem, uh, I remember asking our tour guide, George, who's a wonderful, wonderful uh, man there. He grew up in Jerusalem, local Christian. Uh, he, I was asking about dialects and things like this, and he said, he said, I can tell you what hill a guy's from. Okay, he said, you see that hill over there? We are in Jerusalem. He points across the Kidron Valley. He says, you see that hill over there? I can tell you if someone's from that hill. 
how? He said, well, they, they don't say the exact same words we do here in Jerusalem. And there's a couple different little, you know, accent things they do that are different than what we do in Jerusalem. Just on the other hill, and we're talking about modern Jerusalem, modern Judea. If you go back just, uh, you know, 50 years ago in New York, Bob Clancy and Bob Schwabauer is here with us. If you go to New York, in the, in the different neighborhoods, you can tell what neighborhood a guy was from in New York just 50 years ago. Today, this is all disappearing, of course. But anyway, the point is, is that they know this, is, this, is, this Peter is one of the disciples. And so the cock crowed. Now, we'll come back to that later. This denial of Peter, threefold denial, is very similar in all three gospel, or all four Gospels. But in John's Gospel, it's a little more detailed, and you also hear about this charcoal fire, and it's going to come up later on at the end of the Gospel. So John's version of the denial of Peter is actually quite elaborate compared to the synoptics. They just refer to it. John's going to use this as a very important catechetical tool for us. Right? Who, who are going to learn a lesson about the disciples of Jesus and our own lives and how we also in our own lives will often live the life of the disciples. We're going to waver in our faith. We're going to, sometimes we're going to feel like we need a sign. And just when we're just about to lose our faith, Jesus does give us a sign. How often have you seen a miracle in your life? And all of a sudden your faith is just like, you know, uh, impossible is like steel okay but then a few weeks later you, know, you start to waver a little bit life gets difficult this is this is the life of a disciple of jesus so john's showing us that hey you're no different from the disciples of jesus okay if the disciples of jesus struggle with these things you're going to struggle too and look at simon the most important of jesus's disciples and the, the leader of the disciples after the after the resurrection and Acts the Apostles, his role in the early church, which would have been known by the disciples of John in Ephesus in the 90s. Even Simon Peter, that you've heard so much great things about, my disciples. Let me tell you about Simon. So he tells you about Simon, but he also reminds you, not only does Simon flail a bit and even fell into apostasy, and is denying that he knew Jesus, at the very end, he's going to repent. At the very end, He's going to follow Jesus to the cross. So this is a really, really important catechetical tool for John to, to emphasize this point. We might be uncomfortable hearing about the disciples kind of wavering in their faith or Peter doing this, but John's emphasizing this for our own sake. This is catechetical. We need to hear this. Okay, uh, so chapter 18, verse 28. Chapter 18, verse 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the Praetorium. The Praetorium is in Jerusalem. I think Jim's got his nice uh, Great Adventure Bible, the map of Jerusalem there. You can see the Praetorium there on the map. <clears throat> so the, the Praetorium was the, this is the place where Pontius Pilate and his soldiers could hang out. There it is. He's got it uh, a little closer there, Jim. <laughs> so, so you get the Praetorian there. Um, it's Caiaphas' house and the palace. Up, 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 up. Yeah, there it is, Praetorian. Okay, so you see it up in the upper corner of, of, of Jerusalem there. This is why, by the way, thank you, Jim. This is why, by the way, in Acts, when Paul's in the temple, this is the end of the book of Acts, and there's a mob scene. They try to kill Paul. Within seconds, Roman soldiers are on the scene and break up the mob, and they grab Paul and haul him off to the Praetorium. It's right there. You can see today, if you look at a, um, the, temple, the temple mount, you can still see the remnants of it off to the right there. <clears throat> so the, in fact, today, if you go to Jerusalem, if you go to Jerusalem this night, you can walk through uh, some of those parts. So the they're right there on the scene they're, when Paul gets mobbed. Here, the Praetorium, this is where Pontius Pilate is stationed with his guard and the centurions, the soldiers. Pontius Pilate was originally stationed in Caesarea Philippi. If you remember, uh, there's two Caesareas that you hear about in your New Testament. Most people know about 
Caesarea Philippi, sorry, I misspoke, Caesarea Philippi, which is way up north. But Caesarea Maritime is where Pontius Pilate was stationed. This is just northwest of Jerusalem on the beach. The Roman Empire did not use Jerusalem as an administrative center. It was worthless for them from that standpoint. The Roman Empire was on the offensive, not on the defensive. Having a city up on a hill is a defensive position. So the, uh, in the ancient world, this region, they built cities on hills because they were worried about enemies attacking. You don't want to see them coming. The Roman Empire controls the whole place. It's not worried about hill, hilltop uh, cities. The Roman Empire wants port cities because it can bring in its boats with its soldiers and then ship the money back to Rome. That's what they're all about. Ship out the soldiers, bring the money in. That was the whole point of the Roman Empire. So, the, uh, so they used a port city that Herod had built, Caesarea Maritime, Caesarea on the coast there, which is just northwest of Jerusalem on the beach there. All right, so, oh, good. And yeah, look at that. Bob Clancy's got his map out as well, and you can see Caesarea Maritime. Very nice. Uh, I can recommend that Bible because I don't get any royalties from it. So they already paid me for it. It's all done. But it is a nice Bible. It's a very, the, the maps are helpful there. All right. So then, chapter 18, verse 21. They themselves did not enter the praetorium so that they might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. So it's nice to know, you know, where's the Praetorium? These are not just random places. In the first century, the people knew where these things were. They would go to Jerusalem. They would have a sense of these things. The Christians who lived in Ephesus, you know, they would, it would have probably been to Jerusalem, some of them once or twice, many times in a lifetime, especially merchants, you know, going through the Mediterranean. So the... Um, so the, the, where the Praetorium, it's nice to know the approximate locations of these things. I try to recommend you look at maps when you can. So then uh, they don't want to be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Now, hold your hand there and flip back to chapter 13. Chapter 13. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, and now we have the meal scene. This is the John's Last Supper. And I don't know of anyone that would debate whether or not this is the same Last Supper as in the Synoptics. But John tells us that the meal happens before the feast of Passover, before the feast of Passover. So that raises a question then, what in the world was Jesus doing with his disciples when they were eating at this supper? In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three synoptic gospels, Jesus says, go prepare the Passover meal for me. And the disciples go, it says, and prepare the Passover. And they go tell Jesus the Passover spirit. And then Jesus comes and he says, I have been waiting to eat this Passover with you. So there's no debate. The Synoptic Gospels tell us clearly the last supper that Jesus had with his disciples was in some way a Passover meal. But when we come to John's Gospel, we come to a little bit of a conundrum. It says in chapter 13, verse 1, that Jesus is having a meal before the feast of Passover. And if this is the same meal, which again, I, I don't know if any commentators would disagree with this, if this is the same meal, the same supper in John chapter 13, that is the last supper, Passover meal in the Synoptics, then we have a little bit of a problem. Jesus seems to be celebrating a Passover meal before the feast of Passover. And then we see again a hint at that in chapter 18, verse 28. It says, that they did not want to enter the praetorium so that they might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. All right, so 
if you just take that reference right there, some have suggested, well, Passover meal can be a reference to, or Passover can refer to um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Remember, Passover is the first night of, a, of, a seven, of seven days then of unleavened bread, Exodus chapter 12. And so the word Passover and unleavened bread were used interchangeably in the New Testament. And that's true. So you got to look carefully when you see Passover, unleavened bread. Are you talking about the first night of, the, of, the, of this week-long feast? Or are you talking about the whole week-long feast? And so if you look at just this reference, you could see this as, well, they want to keep the Passover. That is, they want to be able to continue to eat the unleavened bread for an entire week. But this is not the only reference to this issue. We saw in chapter 13, verse 1, before the Passover, before the feast of Passover, Jesus had a supper with his disciples. And that supper has historically been understood by Christians to be the same supper that we see in the Synoptics, which is called a Passover. And so therefore, we have a problem. Jesus is celebrating a Passover meal before the feast of Passover. So what's going on? Well, we're going to see more hints at this, but it seems to be we have a calendar issue, that there are two ways to calculate Passover in the first century, at least two. There is the way the Essenes were doing it and the way that the temple system was doing it. And the temple in this particular year, the Passover is falling, according to this gospel, is falling, falling on a Friday evening or what we would call Friday evening, what the Jews would refer to as the beginning of Saturday. Okay, so this is after sunset on what we would call Friday. Then, as soon as the sun's all the way down, you are now technically on Saturday, the Sabbath. And so now they would celebrate the Passover meal. This particular year, it happened to fall on a Sabbath, which is why it's called a high Sabbath. We'll see this later. So then what in the world was Jesus doing earlier? Three days earlier, before his crucifixion. Well, John is very keen on showing us that Jesus is the Passover lamb. He, said, he began this gospel by, by telling us that John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is, this is the first announcement about Jesus from John the Baptist. He's the Passover lamb. A lot more going on there too, but he's the Passover lamb. And this is a theme that we're going to now pick up at the end of the gospel here. Jesus is the Passover lamb. And John's really going to emphasize that, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover of the Jews. So what was Jesus celebrating then earlier, three days earlier, the Passover of the Essenes? According to the Mosaic calendar, Jesus was a traditionalist. Remember, he keeps the Mosaic law perfectly. The Jews in Jerusalem, the Levites, the Sadducees, are not keeping the Mosaic law perfectly. Far from it. And one example of that, which the Essenes were upset about, is that they were following a solar calendar from the Babylonians. But the Essenes stuck with the lunar calendar, the old Mosaic calendar. They were the arch-traditionalists. Jesus celebrated the Passover in the Essene quarter, the upper room that we still know by Christian tradition, though the Jews tried to take it from us. We think God at least are allowed to get in there now and walk around the place. Last time we were there, we proclaimed the gospel. It kind of upset some people, but it's, a, it's just a, a Jewish tourist trap now. You got to pay to get in and everything, but it's, it's, a, it's, the, it's a church. This is the first church of the church, and it's been taken by the Jews. But anyway, the, uh, the upper room, you can still, at least now, Christians are allowed to walk into the place. Uh, and the, uh, the upper room is in the Essene quarter, not far from the Essene gate, where the wall of Jerusalem, uh, you know, completed the border of the city there. And so Jesus was celebrating the Last Supper, the, the Passover meal, in the Essene quarter. And the Essenes celebrated the Passover on Tuesday. Well, what we would call Tuesday night. Okay, so, so this is, why, did, why is John telling us about a, pa, a meal that he doesn't necessarily want to talk about Passover, he wants to emphasize the other Passover, but he tells us that it happened before. John's aware of, and something that he's assuming his audience is aware of, remember these Gospels are written for Christians who already knew the story. 
They're just emphasizing, clarifying certain points. Jesus would have been under uh, guard and been uh, asked questions, interrogated for three days, which is what the regulation was. The Passover lamb had to be inspected by the priest for three days. And only after three days, if the lamb was not limping, the lamb was not blemished, then could it be sacrificed. So the uh, so John's gospel is trying is is aware of this. Of course, John's aware of this, and the early Christians were aware of this. And there's this is emphasizing, of course, that Passover imagery. Okay, more on that later. Uh, verse twenty nine. So Pilate went out to them and said, "What accusation do you bring against this man?" They answered him, "If this man were not an evil doer, a lawless man." man who breaks the law. We would not have handled, hand him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your law. The Torah. So they had told Pilate that he has broken the Torah. They, he, he's not a criminal by Roman law. He's, a, he's broken their own law. And he says, well, then why are you bothering me? Right? You Jews have 365 different laws that you follow about whether you can eat bacon or not. Go, do, go deal with this on your own. Punish him for breaking your law on your own. And they say, oh, no, no. They, we are not allowed to put him to death. It says the Jews said it is not lawful, according to Roman law, to put any man to death. This was to fill the word which Jesus had spoken to show by what death. He was to die. Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own accord, or did someone say this to you? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? So don't try and pull me into your, your you and these Jews, they're, they're, your whole argument about the Torah. He says, Your own nation, the chief priests, have handed you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus said, my kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight, that I might not be handed over to the Jews. But my kingship is not from this world. Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus said, you say that I am a king, and for this I was born, and for this I have come to the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is the truth hears my voice. So you can think back to a number of passages, chapter 5, chapter 10. Let's just go back and look at those to remind you of them. It's very rich here. Uh, chapter 5. This is when Jesus talks about hearing the voice for the first time. This is chapter 5, verse 25. I'll start up there. Now, truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also of life in himself and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. So look at the judgment seat here in, in earlier. Uh, we're looking at. Do not marvel at this for the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Now, if you move forward now to chapter 10, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. A thief and a robber. Okay, now hold on to that. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. All right, so we'll come back to this later, but this is the shepherd goes early in the morning while it's still dark. He calls his sheep and they hear his voice. They recognize he calls them by name and they come forth. All right, so... We know, of course, we already talked about the preliminary reference to the resurrection of Jesus. And what's going to come later with the story of Lazarus, right? Lazarus, come out. So he calls him by name. This is chapter 
11, verse 43, and Lazarus comes forth from the darkness, right, out of the sheepfold. So more on that later. But notice this. It says, this is chapter 18. He says, uh, verse 37, Pilate said, so you are a king. Jesus said, you, you've said that I'm a king for this. I was born for this. I've come to the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? So he totally disregards this. He has no interest in Jesus' words. He has no interest in this dispute among the Jews, this law. He's a pagan. After this, he said, after he'd said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no crime in him. So he states clearly by Roman law that Jesus is innocent. Now, Pontius Pilate's job in Jerusalem is to keep the peace. Here's the problem. Pontius Pilate's not supposed to be in Jerusalem. He's supposed to be in Caesarea Maritime. That's his normal residence. That's his seat. That's the administrative capital for the Roman Empire for this region. But, in, but the, he has now been transferred to Jerusalem and is temporarily there because there's so much trouble in Jerusalem. The Jews are causing trouble. There, you get Pharisees killing uh, uh, Roman soldiers. There's rebellion happening. You go read Josephus on the history of the Jews, the wars of the Jews. You can hear about all the stuff that's going on at this time in Jerusalem. Pontius Pilate was was transferred temporarily to Jerusalem as a temporary place until the thing calmed down. Now, it never calmed down. It only got worse. Pontius Pilate was not very bright. He allowed all sorts of problems to develop while he was there, and his mismanagement, mismanagement along with a number of other things, seemed to eventually led to the destruction of Jerusalem. So he does a lot of really foolish things. But the um, Pontius Pilate's transferred there, ideally, to keep the peace and to keep from keep the riots from happening and keep everything calm. Here he is trying to keep Roman law, and he proclaims Jesus is innocent. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at Passover. Will you have me release for you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. Okay, so hopefully you can hear the echo back to chapter 10, right? They're going to choose a robber instead of the true shepherd. Now, hold your hand there and flip back to Ezekiel 34. We talked about this earlier when we were looking at chapter 10. Ezekiel 34. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak have not strength, you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the crippled you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered, because they were, there, there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered, they wandered all over the mountains, and on every high hill my sheep were scattered over the face of the earth, and none to, and with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, because my sheep have become a prey, my sheep have become a food for all the wild beasts since there was no shepherd, and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Right? They're, they're, thief, they're thieves. They're stealing. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand, 
and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed the sheep themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they may not be food for them. So it's going to take the sheep back from the shepherds. Now, who are the shepherds? We're not talking about actually shepherds out in you know, the Judean desert. This is the, the leaders of Israel. God says through Ezekiel that the people of Israel have been led by people who are supposed to be shepherds, but instead of taking care of the flock, they're stealing from the flock, right? They're taking everything from the flock, but giving nothing back. A shepherd is supposed to be caring for the flock and from the fruit of the flock, from the extra, right? The flock flourishes under the shepherd and there are plenty, there's a plentitude of sheep. And so the shepherd is able to take wool from the flock. He's able to harvest some of the sheep once in a while, right? Because the sheep are flourishing under him. But here, you have shepherds who are doing nothing for the sheep, but simply raping and pillaging, taking whatever they want, like thieves. Verse 11, for thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. And he goes on to talk about uh, how he's going to take care of the sheep. And then in verse 20, uh, see so verse 22, he says, I will save my flock. They shall no longer be a prey. I will judge between sheep and sheep, verse 23, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. Right? Who's David? David's the king. Right? So David's the, the shepherd king of Israel, and certainly not the thief. Now, you flip back to John's gospel, you can see how rich this is. Jesus says that he's, he, says, he compares himself to a good shepherd. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I call my sheep by name. They know me. I care for my flock. Everyone else, robbers, thieves. So Jesus is the king of Israel, that is David, who has been appointed, who is the good shepherd. And Jesus, of course, in John's gospel, we see throughout the New Testament, Jesus is not simply the king of Israel. He's not simply the, the long way Messiah. He's the divine king. As you know, as you recall from the Old Testament, the first king of Israel, God, right? Everyone knows that. The first king of Israel, God. This is why God becomes man, not as the high priest, as we'd expect, but rather as the king, right? This is really important to grasp. So the, the God is the first king of Israel. But they reject him from being their king, and they want a human king. So God becomes the human king and resolves the problem. God writes beautiful poetry with our scribbles. All right. Chapter 18, verse, chapter 18, verse 40. They cried out again, not this man, but Bar Abbas, son of the father. This is an example of uh, what I've shown you in other places in the New Testament. The Jews in the first century were not speaking Hebrew. They were speaking Aramaic. This was not even, a, <laughs> this is not even something anyone even debated up until recently. Today, uh, there's kind of a, a confusion because when you go to modern Israel, to the modern state of Israel, you hear Jews speaking Hebrew. Oh, so, and, you, and a lot of people today, they, they think that somehow the Jews have been in Israel for the last 2,000 years, from this moment here in the, in the book, the New Testament, all the way to the present. But no, that's not the case. You know, there's a long, complicated story there. Uh, the modern state of Israel is a reconstitution of the Jewish state, and they've re, uh, they reinstituted the use of Hebrew. And so that today now Jews in Israel are speaking Hebrew again. But in the first century, the language of the Jews was Aramaic. And this is why the earliest Christians spoke Aramaic in Judea and Syrian region. And then also, they also spoke Greek. These were the languages of the early Christians. Bar Abbas, Aramaic. Uh, son of the Father. Son of the Father. So, Son of the Father... Well, who's the son of the father in this gospel? <laughs> Jesus is the son of the father. So there's this 
counterfeit shepherd who is the, the son of the father. No, he's not the son of the father. He's a counterfeit. He's a robber. He's a thief, as we hear here. He's not the king of Israel. And the Jews ask for a robber and a counterfeit instead of the true shepherd, the true son of David, the true God and king of Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen.